Mysteries in the West 1. Strange Rites In an instant rise from time and space. Set the world aside and become a world within yourself. Shabastari, Secret Garden It is the night of Saturday, especially consecrated to a ritual which is awesome to us faithfully followed by the devotees of a certain cult. Two groups of eleven, dressed in colourful costumes, carry out complicated movements within an enclosed space. They at times respond to musical stimuli applied through a primitive instrument by a man of seeming authority who, with a few assistants, supervises their activity. Entirely surrounding the area devoted to the ritual, a congregation gives its responses. At times the people sing, sometimes they shout, sometimes they are silent. Some wield an instrument which gives forth a strange sound. Much care has evidently gone into the planning of the geometrically designed arena. Around it are colourful insignia, flags, banners, decorations probably designed to raise the emotional pitch of the individual and the group. The atmosphere is eerie partly because of the abrupt changes in emotion. Their reaction to the ecstatogenic processes being enacted in their midst is so explosive at times that one wonders why they do not spill over into the sacred enclosure. Both joy and sorrow are manifested among the votaries. We are observers at a floodlit association football game. What is missing from the observer's account is a knowledge of what is actually happening, and why. If we have this knowledge, we can identify the players, crowd, referee, and the use of the chalked lines. If we do not, we continue. Here a man writhes on the ground, another grimaces, sweat pouring from his face. One of the audience strikes himself, another his neighbour. The totem rises into the air and is hailed by an awesome roar from the assembly. Then we see that blood has been shed. Other forms of ritual are subject to a similar approach by those who have not been through the experiences which precede their staging. Even more important, very many rituals of one kind or another have undergone alteration throughout the ages, the original intention or force being lost. When this happens, there is a mechanical or associative substitution of other factors. The ritual is distorted, even though there may be apparent reasons for its every aspect. This development is what we can call the dereliction of cult behaviour. Here, now, is an externalist account of a dervish ritual, in which events are described from the point of view of the observer alone. The author is the Reverend John Subban of the Methodist Episcopal Church, who was present at this event in India. Tonight is Thursday night, the night which is specially sacred to the Sufi. Come, let us visit some shrines and see for ourselves what strange religious rites are practiced almost at our very doors. We enter a dimly lighted room where a number of men are gathered. As we do so, a signal is given by a man who appears to be the leader of the assembly, and the doors are shut. There is a hush as twelve men form into two parallel lines in the centre of the room. The glimmer of a solitary hurricane lamp falls on dark faces, in which only the eyes seem to live. The rest of us fall back to the sides of the room. The dicha is about to begin. With a startling clap of the hands, the leader starts swaying from right to left. Very slowly he begins, and the men fall into the rhythm of his swaying. Every time they sway to the left, they call, Who? in chorus. Who? 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 John A. Saban, Sufism, Its Saints and Shrines, Lucknow, 1938, page 1. The dervish ritual is not of the same nature of the football game, far from it. 
Since, however, it is not symbolic but concerned with an interior activity, the advantages of describing such an event in this out-of-context manner are few. The atmosphere engendered by Sufic activity produces for the Sufi himself a perception, leaves a trace which he is able to recognize. It is, however, useless to say that one can recognize in the very being of a certain cult divorced from its origins a sensation that it was once a Sufic one. Material has to be made available in the form in which it can be shared by the reader, at least to some extent. For this reason, it is necessary to start with the inner perception that certain Western phenomena are of this origin, then to see what relatively acceptable formal material exists through which one can illustrate the fact. There are two main methods available for this. The first is to refer to the parallel phenomenon, if there is one, in the East. The other is to seek tracer elements, like technical terms and concealed meanings. In our case we have both, to shed light here upon at least one aspect of what has come to be called the witch cult of Western Europe. Witch, as we are widely informed, simply means wise. This word could occur anywhere and need not be a translation from Arabic or anything else. Wise is a name used by dervish cults and also by the followers of other more or less undiluted traditions. In Spanish, the word for witch is bruja, and it is in Spain that we find early and relatively complete accounts of the rituals and beliefs of the people of Western Europe who celebrated similar festivities and were considered by the church to be votaries of the Black One. We can follow up the clue which is contained in the fact that the Mascara dervishes, although they are found nowadays mostly in pockets of Central Asia and occasionally in India, use the Arabic word whose radical is BRSH. The Mascara, or revelers, are also called Mabrush, marked on the skin, or perhaps intoxicated by the thorn apple. In Spanish, Maha is the Latin-based word, while Bruja, pronounced Brucha, is the word which appeared in Saracen Spain to describe these people. If we assume, for the moment, that Brucha might be a descriptive term adopted by a reveller group, we can try to decode allied descriptive uses by means of Arabic poetic method. What, in fact, does Brucha mean? both in its root form and in its derivations. According to our poetic code method, a number of words of the same consonantal group are taken to add up to a description of a cult, as we have seen in the case of Sufi. Dictionary words give us a selection of a hallucinogenic substance, a symbol and a ritual mark all under this general consonantal grouping. B-R-S-H is Datura stramonium, or thorn apple, pronounced Bash. Alternatively, by similarity of sound, Y-B-R-U-H, root of the mandrake, Syriac loanword, pronounced Yabrur. Both of these contain alkaloids, both were reputed to have been used by witches to induce visions, sensations of flying, and in rituals. What is a symbol associated with witches? A broom. M B R S H A, a brush, broom, scraper, Syrian dialect, pronounced mibrusha. Under the Saracens, there were huge numbers of Syrians in Spain. The Norman-Syrian contact could have been as early as 844 AD, when Seville was pillaged. Translating from the group of words, we can therefore describe a community of people associating themselves with this letter arrangement as associated with the mandrake or thorn apple, using the symbol of the broom, identified by a mark on the skin, 
wearing a party-coloured or motley garb. Such people would be most accurately described in Arabic and in medieval Spain as brujo, masculine, or bruja, feminine, pronounced at the time brucho, brucha. If we accept the connection with the revelers, we can associate further. Their use of the mandrake would provide a further homonym. The colloquialism mabrush, mabrusha, frenzied, a reference to their dancing. The traditional witch's dance has been identified with, or at least compared to, two forms of dance known in Europe. That of the Saracens, the Waltz, which is supposed to have come from Asia through the Balkans, and the Dibka, the Middle Eastern ring dance, known from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf. But there are still numerous other witch facts which can be added to this. Arabic sources quoted by Archon Darul speak of the dance of the two-horned, and give us the clue to the meanings of the barbarous words used by witches, which members of the fraternity even today cannot understand. Here are some of them with their Arabic equivalent. The ritual knife, cryptically called athame, from adhadhame, a bloodletter. Athame is a very fair attempt at the sound represented by adhadhame. The Sabbath, confused by confluence with the Hebrew word, turns up in our Arabic text about the Spanish two-horned people as in fact originating in as zabat, the forceful occasion. A fanciful later etymology is through French, sabatre, to frolic. The same association of sound converted into robin, robinette, the perfectly apposite Semitic rabba, lord, the elusive and mysterious lord or functionary of the sabbat. Rabana, O our Lord, is part of the Muslim prayer, emphatically stressed aloud five times a day. The very word coven eventually found an apparent identification with the idea of convening or gathering together. Yet in the recital of the ritual by a former member of the ancient Hispano-Semitic cult, Kafan refers to the shroud which is placed over the heads of the revellers while they are dancing, reported in witch material from as far away as Scandinavia. By later association, it may have come to mean the meeting or the members, but kafan was certainly used in the earlier form and means a winding sheet. We can now go on to a further stage the witch's ointment, and what it might have been composed of. Why was the ointment originally used? In Arabic, ointment is R-H-M, the word which also stands for blood kindred. Ointment was given to the witch, male or female, after initiation, and after being marked. Maram, ointment, is rubbed onto the skin with a view to establishing a symbolic form of blood kinship. Thus, by an anointing, if we can talk in Semitic roots, the ointment, R-H-M, is applied to help create the condition of blood kinship, R-H-M. It was to be used in the future to take the witch to his or her kindred, R-H-M. So the R-H-M formed the mental, pharmacological link with the R-H-M. But was there no alkaloid or other active principle in the witch ointment? There most certainly was. It will be remembered that the witches made a brew from the bodies or severed members of unbaptized babies. The mandrake root, it will be remembered, is human in shape. It is traditionally thought of as a tiny simulacrum of a human being. A tiny human being is a child. As a plant, we could hardly expect it to be duly baptised. And ingredients of the ointment seem to be this form of an unbaptised one. Too many analogies have been sought for witch practices in Christianity or pagan cults of a pre-Christian kind. If you read works on witchcraft in Europe, you will find that as far as most of their authors are concerned, there was no such thing as centuries of Saracen rule in Spain, 
or generations of absorption of Eastern culture on every level. Even the name, The Wise Ones, could be a direct translation of Arafin, the title assumed by people in the East who believed in the possibility of direct communication with the supernatural. Modern witches seem uncertain about the significance of the size of their circle, nine feet in diameter, and know little about their old numerology. But this material is available elsewhere, even to the measurements. Their own tradition is, incidentally, that they come from the summer land, which is taken by their present-day members to mean the East. Their black man, Moor, and horned fetish, the devil, confused with the moon, belong to the realm of recent operation, working, for recently there has been an attempted renationalization of their cult, tracing it to seasonal and other festivals, and an amalgamation with ecstatic cults, using the Arab code system to formulate their rituals. Who brought the witches to the West? In the medieval form, from which most of our information derives, undoubtedly the Anisa tribe. We have to go back to the deserts of Arabia. The mighty Anisa Bedouin clan, most numerous in fighting men and richest in pedigree camels, is marked in Arab literature for its bitterness in desert war. Bedouin wars provided material for the development of the chivalric code and for love and battle epics. Not to mention the Dibka dance and the bloodletting knife. The patterns of poetry developed by tribal bards was to influence the literature of a score of nations after the expansion of Islam to the north, east and west. The genesis of the Bedouin life lay in pre-Islamic times, in the Days of the Arabs, each day being an epic of some battle whose origin may be forgotten, but whose cultural byproducts in verse, nobility of conduct or military tactics remained a part of the tribe's heritage. This is the Bedouin of the storybooks, the untamed warrior whose gentleness with women and children is proverbial and balanced by his determination to fight to the death for a trickle of possibly muddy water or a palm tree but who would give absolutely everything away in one magnificent gesture. One of the earliest and most bloody of the days was that which lasted 40 years at the end of the 5th century, fought between two sections of the Anisa. Starting with the theft of an ailing she-camel belonging to an old woman, it ended, as the days often did, by an act of mediation. Its end product, characteristic of Saracenic romance, and which influenced all Western literature, was the most famous heroic romance tale of Arabia, the story of El Zir. History brought these people to Europe, and with them much of their culture. One of them was a dervish teacher, deeply involved with the musical, romantic and tribal traditions of his tribe. The parent tribe of the Anisa are held by all Bedouin bards to be the Fakir, or humble in spirit, clan. The appellation was adopted by dervishes, and in one of its deteriorations is applied to itinerant Hindu imitation yogis, who auto-anesthetize themselves and lie on sharp barbs to no clearly ascertainable purpose, unless it be that a moiety of onlookers may hope to be able to emulate them. The Fakir tribe still lives in northwestern Arabia, near their ancestral settlement of Kaibar, the ancient town which was a stronghold in Muhammad's time. The Anisa have many legends, one of them associated with their necessary outward proliferation. According to this story, Wail, the Fakir and ancestor of the whole Anisa, on one night of power, probably the 27th of the month of Ramadan, made a supplication. He laid one hand on himself and one on his magnificent she-camel and prayed that the seed of both should multiply. The result, we are told, 
is that the Anisa are now fertile in both fields, with a current strength of some 37,000 men and about a million head of camels. They have fertility-increasing powers as well. Their tradition has passed, too, into the beliefs of those cults which are dependent upon Anisa membership. Today they are plentiful in the Syrian desert, having fought their way into occupation there over a period of nearly two centuries, ending about the year 1600 AD. The cult of the revelers which is connected with their name, however, goes back at least to Abu al-Atahir, 748-828. to circa 828. A potter and contemplative, he yearned for a greater balance between the glories of Baghdad at the time of Harun al-Rashid, the great caliph, and the development of innate human faculties. He said so to the caliph, who settled upon him an annuity of 50,000 silver pieces. He became a writer and left a collection of mystical verse which entitle him to the position of father of Arabic sacred poetry. His circle of disciples, the wise ones, commemorated him in a number of ways after his death. To signify his tribe, they adopted the goat, cognate with the tribal name Anz Aniza. A torch between goat horns, the devil in Spain as it later became, symbolized for them the light of illumination from the intellect or head of the goat, the Aniza teacher. His wasm, tribal brand, was very much like a broad arrow, also called an eagle's foot. An alternative name for the Aniza is a kind of bird. This sign, known to witches as the goosefoot, became the mark for their places of meeting. Some of his followers, especially the young females, were marked with a small tattoo or other mark, in conformity with Bedouin custom. After Atahir's death before the middle of the 9th century, tradition has it that a group of his school migrated to Spain, which had been under Arab rule for over a century at that time. The symbols and customs associated with the tribal affiliation continued to be used. This is in conformity with dervish practice. Each teacher gives a special flavouring to his school, which changes when the school is taken over by another teacher. The object here is to retain group feeling. Among the witches, primitive tribal ritual derived from the Aniza overwhelmed the Sufi element. Successive inductions of Bedouins into the cult was almost certainly responsible for its reversion to tribalism. All this is not to say that there was no earlier cult in Europe of much the same type. But it does seem to show the elision of the two into what eventually frightened the Church of the Middle Ages, and has remained a piquant mystery to all kinds of people ever since. Even the female lore of the witches is in part so close to the Sufi love poetry of the Middle Ages, especially that of the Spaniard Ibn al-Arabi, that little more need be said on this point. The Quraysh are the noblest tribe of Arabia, and the supreme clan is the Hashemite. They can be considered something apart, for they are the prophetic and royal blood. Next to them, however, come the mighty Aniza. Three rulers today are from this clan, the Saudi Arabian king, the sheikh of Kuwait, and the ruler of Bahrain. This material gives us three main possibilities or ways of assessing and describing the meetings of the witches of the West. The first we could call the survival of the old pre-Christian religion. The second, the importation of the Saracenic cult. The third, an anti-Christian development. Any or all of these, of course, can contain outside elements. The supporters of the old religion theory have pressed everything they can find into service. Horns can for them only stand for the survival of a hunting or fertility rite, 
the dance for this, the animal guise for that. The clerical observers have stressed the feast as a blasphemous sacrament, the marking as a travesty of baptism, and so on. Like our different versions of a football game, the interpretation depends upon knowing what was actually going on, not upon our assumptions that because something was found in a certain place at a certain time, it must accord with our theory or assumption as to what it was. Devil, horns, boiled babies is the one version. God and goddess, fertility dance, secrecy to maintain the old religion is the other. The third is symbol of the Anisa tribe, its teacher, the hallucinogen. The term old religion, which witches and others accept as an indication of the prehistoric origins of the cult, is a standard Sufi phrase, often used as antique faith, old one, ancient tradition. It was stressed by Ibn al-Arabi, the Spanish Sufi, in his love poems. If the ancient tradition did indeed exist in Europe before the 8th century, when the Saracens occupied its main centres, it undoubtedly underwent a complete penetration of the poetic code system, Sufi terminology, and Arab tribal symbolism, for which there can hardly be a parallel analogue of equal depth of influence. What more can we find out from the phrase the antique faith or the ancient tradition? Translate antique, ancient, into the basic Arabic triliteral root of QDM and we get the poetic meaning. QDM is concept of precedence. C.F. Azrari al-Kadim wal-Kadam, The Sufi Secrets of the Past and Future. Here are some of the main derivations from this root to be found in any Arab dictionary. Kidam, precedence, pre-existence. Kidman, old, olden times. Kadam, high rank, bravery. Kadam, human foot, step, stage of movement. Kadum, an axe. Kadim, future. El Kadim, the ancient one, or god. Kadam, chief, leader. This strange word stands for eternity in the sense that it shows that time is eternal. An equivalent in English might be precedence, which carries the meaning of preceding, hence being past, and going forward, meaning ahead. The axe carried by dervish wanderers is called kadum, there are two ancient ones, the ancient, sheikh or peer of the Sufis, and the ancient one, the deity. This possibility of two sorts of preeminent and ancient ones, one human, the leader of the group, and the other, the higher, divine one, is intended to convey a very subtle concept. The Sufis have often been accused of believing that their leaders are divine. Through the special or poetic use of this word, they actually show that there are two versions which this ancient may take. There is another peculiarity of this language, the suggestive and meaningful nature of its words. Arabic words to a Sufi strike them as eloquent. They do convey what, in other languages, need pages to explain they therefore are most suitable to convey occult conceptions. Sheikh al Mushaykh, Tasawwuful Islami, London, 1933, Islamic Sufism by I.A. Shah, page 39. The one is the teacher who has certain qualities of supreme character, as near to deity as may be perceived in a man. Both the Sufis and the witches use a ceremonial limp or staggered step to convey the sense of the Arabic word kadam, a step. There is one important difference in the Eastern and Western versions. In the East, the word kadam, step or stage, is mimed for purposes of cryptographic transmission. The Sufi takes a step sideways or stamps 
in order to commemorate the actual root word. When he makes a definite step, either as a recognition signal or during a ceremony, he is doing this to affirm the continued transmission of the three-letter word QDM. By working this word into the proceedings, the framers of the ritual or password system have made sure of its survival, at least among people who can understand Arabic words to any extent. In my own experience, when instructed in the method of making a certain step signal, I was sent away to study all the elements of the word for step. From this study, in turn, emerges the realization that the system is the antique faith that is divided into stages or steps, that it proceeds step by step, that it is ahead as well as of the greatest antiquity. It is more than obvious that in the transmission of outer forms in non-Arabic speaking countries, a similar adaptation of words has not taken place. Ideally, if the idea of an antique faith with a progressive destiny were translated into English by witches or whatever they might be called, they should have chosen such a word as succeed. Succession means to come after, but it also connotes something which is to be in the future, something which can be attained. Speaking from the point of view of the process which is being described, then, the ancient knowledge would have to become known in its Western transition as succeed. The Swedish witches of Mora adapted the concept correctly when they hailed their leader as antecessor. The change from one language to another where the old illusions remain is against the evolutionary idea of the Sufis. And it is this very metamorphosis which makes the Sufic development very difficult to study in an academic way. Generally speaking, only the moribund versions, which have lost their movement, will be available. <laughs>